What does ikhlas mean from an Islamic perspective? We say sincerity. What is sincerity? Hudayfat al-Mar'ashi, he said ikhlas is when your outward and inward behavior are aligned. Clear? So what you are doing is representative of what you have inside of you. And what you have inside of you represents itself by what you do. A second definition was given by Imam ibn Qayyim. Ikhlas, sincerity, is when you reach a state where you don't desire anyone to witness your actions but Allah. And you don't desire any reward from anyone but Him. What is it that gives ikhlas this high and unprecedented and unparalleled attribute and virtue? I'm going to share with you, brothers and sisters, a few points, perhaps seven of them. And I don't know which one is more important than the other. The first of them, al-ikhlas, dear brothers and sisters, is a cause of erasing sins, even the most major of them. You're all aware of the famous hadith which Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As narrates, Sahib al bitaqa the man who had a card. Remember, the one who brings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, 99 scrolls worth of sins. Imagine, each one of those scrolls is as far as you can see, 99 of them. This man was a, a binge sinner. I don't know how he had time to commit all of it. May Allah pardon us. He comes to Allah with these crimes and they're about to be weighed against his good deeds. As for his hasanat, his, his good deeds, they don't, they don't find any. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask this man, Atunkiru min hadha shay'a, do you deny any of this? The man will say, no, my Lord. Allah Almighty will say to him, Avalamatka katabati al-hafidhun. Have the angels who are documenting your sins oppressed you in any way with this? He says, no, oh my Lord. Allah will say to him, do you have any excuses? The man will say, no, my Lord. Then Allah will say to him, however, we will not oppress you. You do have a good deed. And then a small card is presented. Imagine, 99 scrolls as far as you can see. And then a small card. And it says inside of it, La ilaha illallah. That was his only good deed. The statement of Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. Then Allah will say, go and witness the weighing of your deeds. The man will say, Ya Rabbi, what is the use of this card? I don't need it. Allah will say, keep it. We will not oppress you on this day. What happens? They are placed on the scale now. His future is at stake. The narrator said, I eat the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَطَاشَةِ السِّجِلَّهْتِ The scrolls of sins went flying up into the air. And the other side of the scales, ثَقُولَةِ الْبِطَاقَةِ The card fell to the ground, outweighed everything. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَلَا يَثْقُلُوا مَعِسْمِ اللَّهِ شَيْءٍ There isn't anything that can outweigh the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the man was forgiven because of one good deed, which was La ilaha illallah. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he comments on this, his minhaj. He said, this is the outcome for someone who said La ilaha illallah with ikhlas, with sincerity. He said, because we know people who will commit major sins from the Muslims who would say La ilaha illallah in dunya, but they still go to hell. How come? Because the ikhlas was different. So I ask you, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, what was it that erased the sins of this man? It wasn't just the shahada. It was the moment of ikhlas. It could have been a moment in the night where he really believed in Allah and he said it from the entirety of his soul. La ilaha illallah. Ikhlas melts away a lifetime's worth of sins. And that's why the prostitute who gave water to a thirsty dog and Allah was grateful to her and he entered her Jannah despite her prostitution. Ibn Taymiyyah, he comments on this. He said, this prostitute woman gave water to the dog with pure, sincere iman. Otherwise, we know not every prostitute who gives water to, to a dog enters Jannah. Do you see? So we said point number one, ikhlas. What does it do? It dissolves mountains worth of sayyat, brothers and sisters. That's ikhlas, sincerity. Number two, ikhlas, sincerity, brings you hasanat, deeds, that you never did. Imagine meeting Allah with siyam and hajj and Quran and other noble deeds of justice and khair and goodness that you never did. You intended it if the opportunity came. And that is why the Messenger وسلم, said, as Muslim narrates on the authority of Sahl ibn Hunayf, Man sa'ala Allah ta'ala shahadata bi sidqin ballagahu Allahu manazila shuhada'i wa imma ta'ala fi rashi. He said, whoever asks Allah for martyrdom with ikhlas, with sidq, with truthfulness from his heart, Allah will give him the position of martyrs even if he ends up dying on his bed. La ilaha illallah. See, ikhlas brings you hasanat that you didn't do. Uh, there was subhanAllah an amazing story I read. This is just a quick tangent. A man called Amr ibn Layth, he was one of the Muslim army generals in the land of Khurasan. And he died. When he died, people saw him in a dream. They said to him, what happened when you met Allah? How was it when you met Allah? Are you okay? And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave my sins because of an intention I had when I was still alive. He said, when I was still alive, 
I once climbed a nearby cliff and I looked at my army and I was amazed at their numbers. I was amazed at how equipped they were. And I said in my heart, I wish I could have lived during the time of the Prophet ﷺ to support him with my men. So Allah was grateful for that intention and he erased all of my sins. Ajeeb, la ilaha illallah, subhanallah. Number three, ikhlas, brothers and sisters, amplifies your good deeds or diminishes them. It's the secret ingredient that when it is added to something, it grows in barakah and size. How many good deeds can we do in our lives? Say you do a good deed, the value of it is X. Then you plug in this formula called ikhlas, sincerity. That deed becomes X to the power of 10, or X to the power of 700, X to the power of a million, depending on how pure your sincerity is. That's a smart investment. رُبَّ عَمَلٍ صَغِيرٍ تُحَظِّمُهُ النِّيَّةِ وَرُبَّ عَمَلٍ عَظِيمٍ تُحَقِّرُهُ النِّيَّةِ Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he said those words. He said there may be a small action, but the intention makes it huge. And there may be a huge action, but the intention makes it what? Intention makes it small. What are you intending when you pray? What are you intending when you recite Quran? Purify it, ya ikhwani, ya akhawat. And watch how Allah will reward you in ways that you and I, we don't deserve. You know the famous hadith where the Prophet wasallam said, Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Abu Hurairah, he said, Man bi'adli tamrah. Whoever gives a charity even as small as a date. What is a date? Min kasbin tayyib. From pure money, halal money. No alcohol, no interest, no pornography, no drugs. From pure income. وَلَا يَقْبَلُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا الطَّيِّبِ And Allah only accepts that which is pure. What happens? You've given a charity. What happens? فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يَقْبَلُهَا بِيَمِينِهِ Allah receives that charity in His right hand. ثُمَّ يُرَبِّيهَا لِأَحَدِكُمْ كَمَا يُرَبِّي أَحَدُكُمْ فَلُوَّهُ Then Allah will nurture that good deed. He will nurture that charity. He will foster it. The same way you nurture your mare, your animal. Until that sadaqah becomes like a mountain on the day of judgment. It's an amplifier. This is number three. Ikhlas is an amplifier of good, those good deeds. So don't let your efforts go to waste. You're praying, fasting, you put on your hijab. Khalas, purify the intention. You're doing it anyway. Get the most, the greatest return on investment. Number four, ikhlas is a transformer of deeds. Yani you can take a normal action, something mundane, normal, neutral, like eating, drinking, your matrimonial relations, neutral matters, normal matters, you pass it through ikhlas and then it transforms it into worship that will please you on the day of judgment. You know, since antiquity, alchemists have been in their labs toiling away trying to discover this apparatus that will transform worthless materials into precious items, right? You know, to transform rocks into diamonds, stones into gold, right? They've been doing this for years. That apparatus exists, alhamdulillah, it's called ikhlas, the intention, ikhlas. Take something normal like sleeping, put it through this apparatus, it transforms into something very valuable. On the day of judgment, hasanat, good deeds, that will save you, take you to Jannah. And so, Mu'adh ibn Jabal the Sahabi, the scholar, he said, I fall asleep at night, and I hope that Allah will reward me for my sleep the same way He will reward me for my prayer. In other words, He is saying that I'm intending to pray at night. So my sleep, I hope Allah will reward me for every second of snoring, every tossing and turning. I hope Allah will reward me for that sleep because I have a good intention attached to it, which is what? To pray at night. La ilaha illallah. I remember one of my teachers, he said to me, when we were still in Yemen studying, we were in the house of our Shaykh and someone knocked on the door. So he said, my teacher, I went to the door to open. Shaykh said to me, hold on a minute, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to open the door. He said, okay, sit down and I'll do it. So he went to the door, he opened it and he came back. He said, you know uh, why I told you to sit down? Because you don't have many good intentions. Like you just want to open the door. You're going to let this opportunity go to waste. Let me tell you what I intended when I went to open the door. Well, I intended to walk towards my brother and assist him. So not keeping standing in the sun. I intended to, when I see him, smile. This is a sunnah. I intended to put my right hand in his right, and this is also a sunnah. I intended to give him the full Islamic greeting. This is also a sunnah. I invited to bring him into my home. This is a sunnah. I intended to honor him in the house. This is a sunnah. I intended to give him space in the majlis. This is a sunnah. He listed around 40 or so intentions just to open the door, right? What does the niyyah do? The niyyah transforms. Transform. The niya, ikhlas, sincerity, it is the cause of divine sponsorship of your projects. Are you doing something for the religion? Are you posting things about Islam? Are you preaching? Are you writing? What are you doing? If not intended, when there is ikhlas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His divine self will take it upon Him, His divine self, to take your project and to spread it to the four corners of the world, even if all of the odds are against you. Just show Him ikhlas. He will do the tough part, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim, he called people, alayhi salatu wasalam, to do hajj from Mount Abu Qubais in the barren, desolate, 
empty desert people. Allah has instructed you to do Hajj. Come to Mecca. No one was there. Has Allah not conveyed the message? Why? Because ikhlas. Ikhlas. When you say Muwatta, the name of a compilation of hadith, what name do you think of? What name do you think of? Imam Malik. Do you think of any other name? We think of Malik. He authored the Muwatta. He compiled the Muwatta of hadith. Did you know, dear brothers and sisters, that during the time of Imam Malik, there were many Muwattas. There were many similar compilations of hadith with that name, Muwatta. So people came to Malik and they were like, why are you troubling yourself? This has been done before. How is this going to be novel? How is it going to be any different? Imam Malik, he said, show me something that's been authored. That's a Muwatta. They said, here's a Muwatta. So he looked at it for a moment. He closed it, he put it aside. He said to them, listen. You will soon find out which of these books were intended for Allah. You will find out. The narrator said, It was as if those books were just thrown in a well. We don't know of them. When you say Muwatta, you don't think of the Muwatta of Ibn Abi Dhir that exists, or the Muwatta of Ibn Wahab that exists. May Allah accept from them. You think Malik. You don't think anyone else. Why? We think it's ikhlas. And in another narration, he said to them, ما كان لله يبقى. What is intended for Allah will remain. And Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyyah and al-Rabi'ah ibn Khuthayn, they said, everything that is intended for other than Allah will fade away. Sooner or later. Don't get too caught up with those uh, retweets and those shares and that huge exposure and coverage. It means nothing. It's a matter of time. It's like a Frankenstein. That's connected to a life support machine. It looks big and strong and tough. You switch up the machine, it's dead. That is the project of a Muslim when it is not mixed with ikhlas. It will, it's bound to fail sooner or later. So it's a what? It's a cause. Ikhlas is a cause of divine sponsorship. Allah will take your project and carry it, send it to the world if we are sincere in what we do. The penultimate one I wanted to share with you is also Al-Ikhlas, brothers and sisters, is a means of your, uh, is your savior from your worldly stresses. Are there things that keep you up at night? Do you have anxieties that bother you? Do you have financial stress? Is your Islam not where you want it to be? Is there anything in dunya that's bothering you in any way? Ikhlas is a means of alleviating your stresses in dunya before the hereafter. Look at the story of Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. Ikrima, he spent a lifetime fighting against Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Till the last hour when Mecca had fallen to the Muslims, Ikrimah was still fighting against the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a, a warrior, but a stubborn man indeed. And when he heard that Mecca had fallen to the Muslims, he couldn't bear living in Arabia anymore. He decided to go towards Yemen and live there. His dad, Abu Jahl, had been killed anyway. His wife, Ummu Hakim, had become Muslim, however. He made his way to the coast. His wife, she catches up. She said, Ikrimah! I've just come from the Prophet وسلم, and he promised me that if you come to him, he will accept your repentance. He will not harm you because the Prophet وسلم, pardoned all of the Meccans, all of the pagans, he pardoned them except a few war criminals. He said, no, they are not to be pardoned. Akrima was one of them. So Umm Hakim is saying he's just guaranteed your safety and I have it here in writing. He didn't even look at her. <laughs> he didn't even look at her. And he got onto the boat and he made his way to Yemen. So upset that the Muslims had become victorious. And there, as they were voyaging mid-sea, the boat began to move and the waves were like canopies. And death was not imminent. Akrima began to mutter, shibki, prayers. Prayers calling upon the idols. So the captain said to him, Akhlas, be sincere. Meaning, single out your worship for Allah. Be sincere. La yunjika yawma illa ikhlas. During this moment, nothing will save you but sincerity. Akrima, subhanAllah, at that moment, he said, it was like as if the blinkers of arrogance had just been lifted from me. And I realized that I was just resisting the truth. He said, Ma urani afirru illa min al I'm just running away from the truth. He said, Oh Allah, if you save me, I will go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I will pledge allegiance to him. Allah saved him. Allah saved him. And he went back and he crossed into Mecca, pledged allegiance with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, part of my repentance is that every battle you fight, I will be with you. Akrima, he did this fighting courageously alongside of the Muslims till he got to the battle of Yarmouk. And he was found breathing his last during the battle. And there was three of them who were breathing their last. Al-Harith ibn Hisham, and Abdullah ibn Ayyash, and Akrimah ibn Abi Jahl. And they brought water for Akrimah to drink something before he dies. He said, I think my brother needs it more than me, give it to him. So they went to uh, the other. He said, no, I think my, my brother needs it more. They gave it to him. He said, no, I think Akrimah needs it more. They brought it back to Akrimah, he just died. They went to the second and he just died. And they went to the third and his soul had left him as well. What saved him, brothers? What saved him? What brought back the wife of Akrimah? Because she said to him, if you don't become Muslim, I'm finished with you. What brought back his wife? What saved him from the sea? What brought him Islam? What gave him martyrdom? Sincerity. 
It's a savior from your worldly stresses. Allah supports the sincere ones in dunya before the hereafter. Lastly, this is the seventh one I promised you. Ikhlas is our savior in the hereafter. When you will hear the announcement, Allah said on the day of judgment, this day, the truthfulness of the truthful ones will be benefited by it. That is the day the people of Ikhlas will shine. Al-Junaid al-Baghdadi, who was the famous worshiper of Iraq of Baghdad, spent his whole life reminding and teaching about Allah Jalla Jalla. When he died, people saw him in a dream and they said to him, what did Allah Almighty do to you? How was your standing before Allah? What happened? He said, all of those fancy expressions we used to say have disappeared and all of those complicated words have gone and all of those sciences we used to teach have disappeared and nothing benefited us on this day other than a few units of prayer that we used to pray at night all boiled down to a few actions of worship that were done with ikhlas and that is what will save people on the day of judgment the people of ikhlas